Reading this morning from Luke chapter 24 and from verse 13. Now behold, two of them were travelling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem, and they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was, while they conversed and reasoned, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained, so that they did not know him. He said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, beside all this, today is the third day since these things have happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who had said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road, and while he opened the scriptures to us? So they arose at that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and Suppose they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, Have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate in their presence. And he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven, and they worshipped him, and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. Lord, add his blessing to the reading of his word. Turn again to the passage that we read earlier from Luke 24. 
verses 13 through to 35. The account of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. It can be really interesting to travel uh, a familiar route on foot. When you're driving in the car, you have to be focused on the safe operation of the car. So there's a mass of things out there that you just don't notice, you don't see. Uh, you've got time, though, when you're walking to see details, haven't you? If you're interested in such things, you can uh, take a look at what your neighbours are, are doing, who's hanging new curtains and who's putting new PVC up around the outside of the house. You'll find out that perhaps a neighbour has taken early retirement because all of a sudden that ramshackled old house has got a new sort of refinement to it and the garden's all in order and immaculate. So you can help to walk. you find out all sorts of information. And when you walk, you might sometimes meet someone and talk with them. When you're in the car, you can't always concentrate, can you, on a conversation, uh, on what's said. And if the journey is short, if it's, say, seven miles long, well, you've not really got any time for a decent conversation. But when you walk seven miles with someone and talk with them, then you can really talk, can't you? And this morning I want us to join three people and follow their journey and follow the conversation as well that takes place. And the first thing you find in this conversation is a story of a tragedy, verses 13 through 24, a story of a tragedy. There were two disciples, one is named Cleopas, the other's name we don't know. They weren't members of the twelve or the eleven uh, disciples who formed the apostolic band, but they were disciples of Jesus, and they're walking seven miles, probably, not quite sure, but probably to the northwest of Jerusalem, to uh, the little town of Emmaus. And as they walk, they talk, and they talk of grief. Their whole world and all the hopes that they'd had had collapsed in the death of Jesus, And as they walk and talk, we are told, a stranger draws alongside them. God had restrained their eyes so that they should not recognize him. And they probably assumed that he was just one of the many pilgrims who had been up to celebrate Passover at Jerusalem. And now he's on his way home and he asks them what it is they're talking about and why they look so sad. And they say in reply, well, uh, you the only person who's been at Jerusalem this week who doesn't know what's been going on there? Did you spend your week in the room? Haven't you heard? Don't you know the things that have happened there in Jerusalem this week? And Jesus says, what things? And the whole tragic story just tumbles out of them. And notice what they say. Notice Notice how firm their faith is in the face of the tragedy. Uh, In verse 19, uh, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified, but we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Do you hear what they're saying there? Their hope had been placed upon him and now their hope has been shattered and it lies in tatters but when they think of their hope they still they still can't let go of Jesus he's still the center he's still the focus and they're still talking about Jesus of Nazareth their mighty prophet and their hoped for redeemer and notice that even though they he had suffered such a an ignominious death on the cross, they unashamedly stand by him, and they are unabashed, aren't they, to declare great things about him. They're telling, they think, a stranger about him, and they're unafraid to sta- state openly that they disagree with what the high priests, what the chief priests had done. And that was a risky thing to do. Unashamedly, they speak of Jesus of Nazareth as the center of their hope. Disappointed hopes, yes. But even in the midst of tragedy and in the midst of disappointed hopes, 
Their love will not let go of Jesus, and their faith, though shaken and perhaps no longer having in their minds any real basis at all, shattered as it may have been, is, it is still focused on Jesus of Nazareth, their mighty prophet and their coming redeemer. And can that not be carried over into your experience and into my experience today? Because there are disciples today who walk in darkness and who fear that their faith is about to give way, about to collapse entirely. And yet somehow they find that they still can't let go of Jesus, the expected Redeemer, the mighty prophet. You may think that your faith today is pretty weak and fragile, but if you have a God-given faith, what you'll find is that it takes a lot to smash that to pieces. In fact, it's not possible. Because if it's a God-given faith, it will always anchor you to Jesus. Even in this tragedy, even in the the darkness they were going through at this time, they couldn't let go of, of him, Jesus of Nazareth. And you might just need to be reminded of that today because you might be walking in similar circumstances. And then notice as well the scepticism that they speak of here because it's a valuable scepticism. Verse 21, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us when they didn't find his body. And they came saying they'd also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Uh, They they say then that uh, these women had come with this testimony and that someone went to check it out and they found it just as they said, but him they did not see. So when the testimony of these women was first reported to the disciples, they really didn't set much store by it at all. It wasn't thought that their testimony was valid, that it could be relied upon. Now that doesn't mean that the Bible itself teaches us to have a low view of the testimony of of women, or a low view of women for that matter. It's simply a fact that at that time and in that culture, in their situation, the witness of women was not regarded as valid. It couldn't be given in a court of law as legal witness. And yet, strangely and surprisingly, the Lord makes women the first witnesses to his resurrection. And often it's the case the Lord just doesn't bend to our expectations. But I want you to notice that these are Christian disciples, and these Christian disciples didn't regard the testimony of these women as valid testimony. And so they question it. And they have men go and check it out to verify, to confirm what the women had said. There was a certain scepticism over their report. And though that might not have helped them, I'm nonetheless glad that they were sceptical. Because that tells me that if they were going to believe that Jesus Christ had been raised from the dead, they were going to have to be persuaded of it against their will. These accounts of Jesus, you see, having been raised from the dead, they're not the product of wishful thinking, as if the disciples just couldn't believe that it was all over, and so they conjure up in their own minds a story of resurrection to keep the whole thing going somehow. This isn't an exercise in wishful fulfillment. That's what some suggest when they read the resurrection accounts. They suggest that they're They're just fulfilling a deep-seated wish. But if you read the four gospel accounts, you find that in each case, the disciples who are involved in the incidents are clearly not involved in wish fulfillment. In fact, if anything, they were not going to believe unless there was evidence given to them. You see, they weren't a bunch of gullible, sentimental, silly men. They weren't going to believe a load of old mush as if they could wish Jesus into existence against the facts. 
And if they came out of this believing that Jesus really did rise from the dead, it was because they were convinced of it by the evidence against their will. And I'm saying you can trust the testimony of people like this. It wasn't that they just wanted to believe this. And this is one of the reasons why I find the testimony of the New Testament with regard to the resurrection of Jesus Christ convincing when it tells me that he has been raised from the dead. So their skepticism is a valuable thing. It's valuable to us, valuable to me. But then I also want you to see how in their tragedy, how near comfort was at hand. Verse 15 and 16. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. Do you see that? Jesus himself drew near and went with them. In their despair, Jesus was already there. He heard it all. And they didn't realize it. And do you not suppose that can't be carried over into your experience, the experience of Jesus' disciples today? There are times when your eyes and mine simply do not see and do not sense the presence of the Lord, and we don't realize just how near our comfort is. He is there all of the time, just as he was with these disciples. He hears all our despair, and often we just don't realize it. How near their comfort was. And then the second section of this passage is there in verses 25 to 27, as the Lord Jesus explains to them the Scriptures. Now, just imagine how you or I would would have responded if we had heard their account of disappointment and despair. Probably after they've poured out this tale of sadness, we would say, Well, you know, I know that I can't feel this sadness and this pain as deeply as you feel it, but I can understand that you do feel devastated and crushed by these terrible events. We would want to offer, wouldn't we, some kind of indication that we understand and that we sympathize with them in the grief. Is that what Jesus does? Do you see how he responds to their tragedy and their loss? What does he say there in verse 25? Oh, fools, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. He says to them, in effect, don't you believe the Bible? Sounds a bit blunt, doesn't it? Imagine you go to your pastor with a problem and your pastor just says, well, your trouble is you don't believe the Bible. You say, well, there's not much sympathy there. And then we read verse 26. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory and beginning at Moses and all the prophets he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself? What was the problem then? Why did Jesus have to explain the scriptures like this? Well, the problem with these disciples was not so much the issue of the resurrection. The big problem for them was a Messiah who suffered. When the Jews were thinking about Messiah, they simply would not associate Messiah and suffering. They would associate Messiah with rule, with victory, with kingship. When they thought of Messiah, it was in terms of Isaiah 9, verse 7, of the increase of his government and peace. There will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom and so on. So they thought of Messiah in those terms, reigning and ruling, and his glorious kingdom will come when he defeats his enemies and when he delivers his people. That's how they thought of Messiah. Well, they had that clearly in their minds. But that you associate Messiah with suffering, well, they couldn't grasp that. It was like talking about cold fire. Messiah and suffering, you just can't mix those ideas. They couldn't be connected in their thoughts. And so Jesus has to take them through the scriptures and explain why it was necessary. 
The Christ must suffer these things. He must, and then enter in, into his glory. And he's showing them that if they were to have a biblical picture and comprehension of Messiah, they had to see both those components together, suffering and then glory. And so he begins from Moses, that is from the first five books of the Bible, verse 27, and then the prophets, and expounded in them all, in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. I suppose he must have said something like this. Cleopas, do you remember Genesis Chapter 3 and verse 15, when the Lord said to the serpent, he, that is the seed of the woman who was to come, this victorious man, will crush your head and you will crush his heel. Cleopas, this coming victorious man who will fatally crush the enemy, the tempter, in the process of doing so, the tempter will crush his heel. The coming victorious man is going to suffer too. Or perhaps he took them to Deuteronomy 18 or 34 where the Lord promises through Moses that he would raise up a prophet like Moses. In other words, one day a prophet will come who possesses the stature in Israel that Moses possessed as a mediator over the people of God. And when he comes, well, he's going to experience the same sort of things that Moses experienced. But what did he experience? Well, in Exodus 2, Moses experiences rejection. The people said to him, Who made you a prince and a judge over us? And you remember how in Numbers 14, 11 to 14, how they rejected, repeatedly rejected Moses' authority and rebelled against him. Well, the Messiah is going to come, a prophet like Moses, and he's going to suffer the same rejection that Moses suffered. And then he took them to the prophets. Perhaps he took them to Isaiah in chapter 49. Do you remember the servant of the Lord in Isaiah 49, Cleopas, who was to come and redeem Israel? Do you remember his words, how he said, I have labored for nothing and for vanity? How he depicts the servant of the Lord, Messiah, discouraged over his apparent failure in his mission to redeem Israel. Doesn't it show us Messiah is going to be frustrated by the constant recalcitrance of Israel and suffer rejection? And Cleopas, think of Isaiah 50, where the servant of the Lord brings the word of God to the people, and in so doing, he says, I gave my back to the smiters. And my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard, I did not hide my face from shame. And spitting, don't you see, he must suffer. And Isaiah 53, he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. By his stripes we are healed. He was stricken for the transgressions of my people. Don't you see it, Cleopas? And then perhaps he took them into the prophecy of Zechariah, and said, Do you remember what the prophet said to Zion? Look, your king comes to you, righteous and possessing salvation, and humble, riding on the colt of a donkey. And perhaps he reminded them what those words mean, how that word possessing salvation in the Hebrew actually means one, quite literally, one who has been saved. Doesn't that imply that he will be delivered from some distress and affliction? And the word humble, so often translated afflicted or poor. Isn't that a strange way of describing the king who is to come to you? Saved out of distress and affliction, riding on a donkey. Doesn't that remind you of recent events, Cleopas? And don't forget that Zechariah in the next verse says his dominion will be from sea to sea, sufferings and entering into his glory. Messiah, the coming king, will be afflicted and saved out of distress by God. And perhaps he reminded him of Zechariah's depiction of the repentance of Israel in the last days. The Lord says they will look upon me whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him, that is Messiah. Which is a very interesting passage of, of Scripture. That when they pierce Messiah, they will, the Lord God says, 
look to me whom they have pierced. That is, they've pierced the Lord himself. So Messiah is both divine and suffering, pierced through by his own people. This is the sort of thing our Saviour would have done, and much more fully than I suggested this morning, but with the aim of showing that Messiah is one who had to suffer, and this is the kind of Messiah Jesus Christ is. He must be seen as the suffering one and the king, the coming king. Messiah has to suffer these things. And as Jesus takes them through the scriptures, he shows them that if only they had the scriptures, if they knew them, if they had the light that the scriptures give, it would relieve the distress and the difficulty that they were in. Going through the scriptures, they would understand that their Messiah The one they have is the one promised by Scripture. Now when we see what Jesus does here, this has something very important to teach us today. Notice that it was more important for these two disciples to hear Christ than it was for them to see him. More important to hear him than to see him. Couldn't Jesus simply have revealed his identity to them immediately? Wouldn't that have dispelled their despair and their gloom? But he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. He doesn't give them any kind of special experience. He simply gives them clearer knowledge. And that's very important. Jesus isn't so concerned to bring them relief as to have them understand the kind of Christ and Lord that he is. And if they are to understand the kind of Christ he is, they must go to the scriptures. He expects us to use our minds. And if you don't want to use your mind, if if you just want to enjoy some kind of unusual spiritual experiences, Well, don't pretend to be a disciple of Jesus Christ because he expects you to learn and to know. That's why we don't refer to each other as as converts. We refer to each other as disciples. It's because he expects us to learn the kind of Lord that we have and the life he calls us to is an extended, ongoing discovery of these various elements of the kind of Lord that Jesus is. The kind of Messiah he is. He didn't grant these two disciples instant relief, an instant solution. He put them back in school. He doesn't eliminate their sorrows immediately, but he has them learn Christ because if you get to know him, it is that that will do so much more to eliminate your sorrows and your despairs far more so than him granting immediate relief. So, we've heard the story of the tragedy, and we've heard how Jesus explains the scriptures to them. And then, briefly, I want us to see how they recognized the Lord. In verses 28 through 35, we'll read verse 29. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, For it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him. Then. When it says, then their eyes were opened, it's just another way of saying God, at that moment, enabled them to recognize him. We don't know what it was, whether it was the way in which he broke bread or whether they saw scars of nail prints in his hands. We don't know, but they recognized him at that point. At that point. Isn't it interesting to see how Jesus took control of the situation here? Uh, in, In verse 30, you see Jesus doing what ordinarily the host did, not the guest. He goes into their place, And he takes control of the meal. He breaks bread and gives it to them. 
And at that point, they recognize him. And immediately, that very hour, they go back to the eleven and they tell them what had happened. Verse, verse 35, the end of the verse, and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. That clearly impressed them. It was when he broke bread at the meal that he was recognized. In other words, the Lord Jesus revealed himself to these disciples in a very common, a very ordinary situation. And they never forgot that. I don't suppose they ever sat at a table again in the same way. It would have changed them forever, wouldn't it? And the Lord Jesus can be like that. He can make himself known to us in the midst of very common, very ordinary circumstances in life. He was known to them in the breaking of of bread. There's something, I think, very comforting for the people of God in that. There is a Lord who is still my Lord, who can be known to me in the most mundane, routine, ordinary details and circumstances of everyday life. That's what he's like. Now, you know that. Perhaps, however, you just need to be reminded of it again. He was made known to them in the breaking of bread. And every day, every circumstance, Saviour. So the story begins with them going from Jerusalem... And it closes with them going back to Jerusalem. Why would they do that? Why would they travel seven miles at night? Well, they have a risen Savior who is the Son of God. And they wanted others to know about it too. The Lord bless his word to us this morning.